Thank you very much. Um, so first, a little bit of an introduction of who we are. My name is Jonas Arndt. I work for HPE, and I'm an architect over there. But I'm also part of a, an open source project, ODIM, Open Distributed Infrastructure Management, that uh, HPE is part of as well, and a few other uh, companies and, and participants. And there, I'm on the technical steering committee. Uh, Martin, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Martin Halstead. I'm part of the same organization as uh, Jonas uh, within HP, focuses on infrastructure into telco. Um, and once uh, Jonas has uh, gone through uh, what Odom is, um, then I'll talk a bit about how we plan to deploy uh, and make use of that type of architecture in, as it relates to um, you know, deep edge VRAN type uh, implementations within telco networks. Okay, and uh, just to give you, to go easy on your eyes, we're gonna stop the video here and, and have you focus on the slides instead. So let's do that. Uh, so part of this, uh, presentation is going to be the Odin project and I'm going to go through that a little bit before we dive dive into what Martin said how to use this and, and other things in, in different type of deployments then uh, some of you have probably heard about Odin but I'm still gonna basically introduce it a little bit uh, to start with and there is a certain amount of uh, challenges in today's network uh, deployment for 5g and specifically with we have focused uh, this presentation on telcos, but Odem is applicable in other part of the industry as well. But for telcos, we can see with 5G uh, use cases, uh, there is a lot of push to the edge. There's a lot of new mini data centers. So that you have this distributed type of architecture that you need to manage and you need to manage all the resources in, in those different locations. You also have a, a different type of um, uh, equipment in, in a data center than you have at the edge. So you have this type of heterogeneous platforms. Uh, so at the edge, you might have different uh, constraints like size, temperature, and, uh, and other uh, uh, specifications like NEBS, talking about uh, seismic activity as well. And, and then you add to this that you have different vendors as well. So obviously now, if you are a a telco or something and you're going to deploy all your data centers from different vendors different type of equipment so how do you talk to all this equipment how do you manage it and the equipment as you can see here as well has different type of management apis some of them conforms to a standard like um, redfish uh, some of them do not and even if you conform to a standard uh, there are different implementations from different vendors to conform to this standard and so talking to vendor A's Redfish implementation is not exactly the same as talking to vendor B. And it's not because vendor A or B are, are in any way, shape or form in violation of the specification. It, it's the fact that they have chosen to implement some properties that the other vendor didn't implement or vice versa, right? So you, you need to, you, you have these challenges as well. And then, a lot of vendors have a management solution that is a closed solution that they have on top. And, and uh, if, you, if you think about the situation then that uh, an operator will face, it's basically this challenge here where you have a lot of things that want to use this and you have different vendor solutions. And, and at the bottom, uh, you can only manage your own, uh, your own specific uh, resources from that vendor perhaps but an operator will need to manage it all. So you get this uh, uh, very complicated management solution that you need to put in place. So this is what we're trying to address with ODEM, uh, basically. Uh, so if you look at ODEM then, just to introduce uh, what, what it actually does, on a high level, we have three things. It's doing abstraction and translation, meaning that these different type of uh, nuances of Redfish or different management protocol altogether can be abstracted away from northbound clients. So the northbound client will basically know exactly what Redfish version and what properties in different uh, objects to expect. 
And that's part of uh, what Odom is doing, this abstraction. And it does that with an abstraction layer and with different adapters, so we call them plugins. So, so that's one of the things. The other thing it does is aggregation. And what is, does that mean? Well, on a Redfish level, it, it, it basically means that we have an aggregation service. We, we did put that in place in the MTF when we started the work on Odom. So that is a fairly new type of service. And that will allow us to add and remove resources uh, that uh, an aggregator would manage, basically. New servers, new switches, new storage, and these type of things. But it also means that a client doesn't need to know about the equipment in the data center. It can simply ask Odem. It just authenticates it, okay, itself with Odem, and then it doesn't need to know IP addresses of the resources or any of the credentials. Odem will just uh, list all the available resources for the client. The other thing is that it will allow a client to do bulk operations. Let's go reset uh, an entire rack or let's, let's upgrade an entire aisle in a data center to a new firmware level. These type of operations is also aggregation. Finally, there is proxy. So Odem can be multi-homed and, and the client therefore doesn't need to be on the actual management network. Uh, it, it doesn't have to have connectivity to the management network. So that will allow for more centralized functions like composition, monitoring, and these type of things can, can live northbound uh, in a more centralized location. Uh, so just taking a step back then and looking from a high level what Odin does, it sort of simplifies the picture you saw before to a, a more simple way of managing things. If you start on the southbound side, you have all these, these different management APIs and, and you have these plugins or, or adapters that can do translation from them into uh, the Odin model. And the Odin model, there is no special model. It's actually DMTF Redfish. And on the northbound side, we have DMTF Redfish APIs exposed. So all the services running, there are Redfish services can be communicated with by using a Redfish APIs. So that's uh, basically the vision of Odem. And if we dive in then to the actual uh, architecture and you see everything inside a dotted line here is Odem, you can see that the services lay in the middle is standing up different services, account service, event service, aggregation service, and so on, and hosts also the model. On the northbound side, you have this API layer that I talked about. And then on the southbound side, you have different type of adapters. And I will, I will go through some of those adapters that are available in our first release. They're also, one thing to remember is that they're open source adapters. There are commercial adapters as well from different vendors. And uh, the whole Odin project is uh, licensed Apache 2.0 to uh, enable commercial use and, and uh, commercial different use cases. So if you look at the community then, we started fairly recently. It was actually in July uh, where we formed uh, the project just as uh, an unfunded Linux Foundation project, not part of any umbrella community. But now we have operated a few months and we want to move into LFN. Uh, so we have, we have some plans to do that and hopefully we can get in there in March. Um, there was this LFN development and testing forum this week, and we were we had a track there. So I think there was a, even today there was a presentation there that you might have seen. We run different meetings. It's a technical steering committee committee meeting every Wednesday, and there is a, a more architectural meeting, proposal meeting we call that on Tuesdays, and that's uh, where we discuss bigger uh, com uh, contributions into them and, and these type of things. And there are, there's obviously some wiki pages and, and GitHub pages that you can see here. Apart from that, we had our first release that I'm going to dive into a little bit uh, that came out on Monday this week, actually, because um, January 31st was on a Sunday. Right. <clears throat> so how how is the current contributions looking? So HP did a lot of uh, seed contribution initially. But we also have seen a lot of contributions from Intel. There have been some uh, plugins and there uh, an unmanaged rack plugin that I will get into what that is doing. There have been some, uh, they're working on uh, a management uh, B 
BMC type of emulator. We also see contribution from AMI coming in here soon, a composition service. Uh, there is still some discussions going on in DMTF about that composition service, so we don't know exactly when it's going to land, but we hope it's going to be there before uh, the next release, so it can be part of the August release. Right, so just going through the releases then here, we have just released 2101, which is um, named after the year and the month, and I will dive into a little bit our release process uh, later on. But in that release, uh, just on a high level, when you ins when you clone and you build Odem, you're going to see that it builds uh, in containers and it, it produces uh, a bunch of containers where it, it's running and they're all Docker-based. We have started transitioning over to Kubernetes, but we have we didn't make it in time for this release. So the next release will will see Kubernetes-based release instead or build process. As far as plugin support goes, we have two different plugins. There is a generic Redfish plugin that can be used for different uh, uh, resources that speak Redfish, and I will dive into that a little bit later. And there is the unmanaged rack plugin that I, I uh, talked about earlier, Intel contributing. And we also have uh, a lot of Redfish APIs for, from the different Redfish services there that we go, we'll go through. And out of, from the get-go in the first release, you can do some action then on, on uh, uh, or bulk operations on collection of resources. And the services that are there in 2101 are these services. And, and just a little bit briefly on what each service does. The aggregation service, like I mentioned, can be used to add and remove managers into the aggregator. Like if you have a new uh, server, you can add the server using uh, post operations on the aggregation service. And you also use then information about credentials and these type of things. And after you've done that, the server will show up as a, as a computer system as well as a, a chassis and so on and so forth. Uh, the aggregation service will also allow you to do bulk operations like resetting and, and these type of things. We have another service, update service, for, for doing bulk operations on uh, firmware. Uh, there are other things in the aggregation service that is in DMTF Redfish specification to define your own aggregates and to define your customized um, actions and things of that nature that have not yet been implemented in Odin's version of the aggregation service. So that's something to look for for the future. The event service in um, in Redfish is something that is implemented in Odom as well, and that will allow you to subscribe to events. Uh, events could be a different type of events exist. It could be alarms and, and these type of things. So it's something that a monitoring system would be interested in. The beauty of this uh, is that you can actually, instead of having to set up subscription on each resource in the data center, you can now just say to Odom, hey, what resources do you have? Okay. Uh, take all these resources I have here in my collection and set up this type of event subscription to them. And by the way, here is where you should send all the events. So it's a single operation that will set up subscription for the infrastructure and resources you are interested in or your monitoring system is interested in. So that is quite powerful, actually. And then obviously, Odem has session service, account service. Session service is there to let you log in and, and retrieve a token and use that for, for operations. And account service is, is kind of uh, uh, just set up different roles and accounts. And then we have a, a task management uh, concept, and which is also in Redfish, obviously. For long-running operations, instead of, of waiting for returns, you, can, you will get a task back or a task monitor URI, which you can use to query where what's going on with the operation I asked for, uh, how much is done. And also you can even set up a subscription so when the task is changing a state, uh, perhaps it's, it's done or it failed or whatever, you will get an event. So that's also a possibility. Uh, and then we have the update service and there we only implemented a simple update so far uh, and, and there are gonna be other contributions I, perhaps from other companies to further enhance the update service. Obviously, this is an area where 
you have very different solutions from different vendors. So this is uh, a complicated space. So it's uh, it's difficult to make anything that uh, uh, works across vendors there. But uh, we're going to get there for sure. And then we have registers, obviously the regular uh, Redfish registers that you can query and you can find registers like uh, for the alert for the events and things of that nature. All right. Um, Moving on then for just looking at one of the plugins, the gener generic Redfish plugin, that is a plugin that just speaks Redfish. And one thing that the Odin project is doing as well is releasing Redfish profiles for Odin. And we have not done that as part of this release because they're not quite complete yet, even though you can find them in the, in the source in a separate um, uh, branch. And those profiles, uh, Redfish profile is telling you what properties and what objects you should expect when you talk to Odin. And it's also, so that's for Northbound clients, but it's also telling plugin developers what properties need to be implemented in a certain uh, schema. So, so this, is, this is something that we plan on and making sure that the, the generic Redfish plugin will expect all those uh, properties. We're not quite there today, so the generic Redfish plugin has uh, support for, for most Redfish operations, and, but it, it doesn't really uh, worry too much about uh, 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 this uh, mandatory properties that the profile will put forward. But the, the thing it does certainly a good job of right now is to serve as a plugin template. You can use this uh, and, and start building your own plugin. And we, we obviously, we have used it right now for uh, working on a, an open source plugin for, for Dell servers. It's currently uh, going on in the community. So the generic Redfish plugin is, is useful in that you can do some Redfish operations with it. It's not quite fully mature as far as conforming to the profile, but it's an excellent source if you want to start developing uh, your plugin on your own. Moving on to another plugin then, we have the Unmanaged Rack plugin. And that is a, that is a plugin for racks without managers, and, and most racks don't have managers. And why do we need a, ma a manager for a rack? Well, there are some objects hosted under a rack. Um, for instance, there is things like contains. So you want to go to a rack and you want to ask, what, what do you have in the rack? And then you can look at the contains ob uh, property. And, and there, there should be links to all the chassis that are sitting in the rack, right? There are also other objects like location. So you can get GPS coordinates, uh, what aisle and, 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 and what row is something in. And, and that is another thing that you need uh, from the rack. So you use all this to be able to extract things like topology information, uh, what row, what aisle, what, uh, what floor, and, and things of that nature. And this is key when you do want to set up connectivity, because if you don't have a rack, you, you know that a certain server port is connected to a certain switch, but where is that switch? And then you look at the switch chassis, and you can follow the link to the rack, or you can look at the rack and follow the link to the switch chassis and, and vice versa. So it's, it's key to be able to model a data center. And this rack plugin was contributed by Intel. Uh, and actually it has a, a, a management interface that represents many racks then, and it has, a, it has to save states because when you stick things in, into the rack, it needs to log that uh, as in, in the contains object, so it has a local database. And that is part of the first release. So if you look a little bit then at what is coming up in the next release, and, and this is obviously uh, something that might change, obviously, but this, these are the plans right now. We have development for a, a Dell plugin right now, and the reason for that is obviously we want to have multi-vendor experience from Odin because that's what Odin is all about. Uh, it lives in its own branch right now and there is uh, collaboration between Intel and HPE. We are hoping to attract other uh, contributors here as well, obviously. And then there is uh, the work on the BMC emulator that is going on on the Intel side. And as I mentioned before, we have this uh, composition service that AMI is looking for. And the one thing to mention there is that uh, 
out of the box current composition service in DMTF Redfish does not uh, address things like connectivity and, and those type of stuff. So there is a lot of discussion. There is actually a task force go inside DMTF looking at the composition service. And I'm confident that something really good is going to come out of that. And, and uh, we are providing input uh, from ODIM and, and so on and so forth. So once that has landed in the spec, uh, AMI can, can actually start doing the uh, contribution to the project. And then finally, uh, we are looking at uh, a Cisco ATI plugin as well. We are dealing with the uh, networks in, in a, in, on a fabric level inside ODIM. So we have DMTF Redfish has a, a fabric model that uh, has been enhanced lately to address uh, things like, you know, Ethernet networks, Ethernet fabrics. And today there is a co commercial plugin from HPE for a uh, Aruba-based fabric, but there is nothing in the open source community. So this is what we're looking at to, to get there. And uh, it's more on a, in a discussion phase right now. No, no code has been dropped or anything like that, but uh, it's something that we are looking forward to uh, seeing in the project fairly soon. So that's, I think, for the release. I just want to also mention a little bit about how we do releases. Um, for the first year, because we are we are expecting that we will have more uh, contributors in the future and more participants. But for the first year, we're planning on two releases. The first one just came out. The second one will be on uh, in August. We don't have any maintenance releases uh, right now, and and that's probably how it's going to stay. So if you have some uh, problems with 2101, uh, we you log you can log issues and they will be fixed but don't expect a maintenance release from the project instead there will be a new release that addresses all those in august and as we go on if we look a little bit at the branching model then the development branch is just continuing all the time and you can add features and functionality there but two weeks four weeks before the release we have an integration period and that's where we take longer running uh, projects or sub-projects to ODIM or features, larger features, and integrate them into the development branch. Uh, obviously, for, for any type of small feature, there are feature branches as well, and they will come and go. They will go into development, uh, not specifically in the integration period, but actually it could go in um, uh, all the time. But it's the larger ones that will go in during the integration period. And then we, two weeks before the release, we start the release branch and we release RC0, RC1, and, and so on, depending on how many many uh, issues we, we can see in, in Git. Uh, one thing there is that we don't fix minor things in the RC period. We fix basically uh, bigger showstoppers. So that's how the, the release model looks right now. Obviously, once we make it into LFN, uh, we might review this, and if we get more participants, we might, might step up to three releases per year type of approach instead. Uh, was there any questions here? It's a good opportunity to look at those right now, and Martin, you perhaps you already uh, addressed them. So no yeah, questions. The, so then, uh, no, Martin, I, I think this is where I hand over to you. Sorry? Yeah. Well, actually, just before you do, there was a question on um, how do we support streaming telemetry in Odom? Ah, so we don't have the tele telemetry service right now. Um, so that is being looked at. And I haven't listed that as part of the next release. Uh, it, it, it might show up then, and and as far as stream telemetry, I I don't know. We are we are still kind of um, discussing this a bit in the in the project, and I, I just want to say that I think there are different views on what the te telemetry service is supposed or should should address, you know, them from different participants. So which is very natural. So we right now we're having a discussion, and we want to we want to land on something that is useful for everybody. Um, stream telemetry is obviously one thing. Uh, getting those reports as part of events, telemetry reports, uh, is also a, another use case. 
So we are looking at all at all that, but we haven't really taken a lot of decisions. Martin, uh, the telemetry service has not even been approved by TSC yet, if I remember correctly, right? No, not yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be a fairly common request though um, yeah. from from a number of operators. So it it, it is going to be become an area of focus for Odom. Yeah, and then we have two other questions here. Uh, Martin, do you want to take the the one view question, perhaps? The one view question? Yeah, sure. So, um, so HP one view. The, the, the northbound interface from Odom um, is fully Redfish compliant, right? and, and so um, from the perspective of OneView, um, we're working with that organization in, in terms of them exposing uh, a, a Redfish interface southbound from that stack. Um, so, you know, the, so it's in the plan to support OneView, um, but you know, it, it, it means working within our business units to, um, to get that done. Um, we, we're also in discussions in the same space, you know, outside of, you know, an HPE product, um, but, you know, um, within the, the Odom project itself, you know, as uh, Jonas mentioned earlier with uh, companies like AMI, um, for their composition service. And, you know, from that perspective, you know, there, there are, um, other solutions out there as well that are that are part of the project. Um, I could say, uh, shall I say a couple of words about SNMP? Yeah, please do if you like. I mean, there is currently no SNMP support inside Odom. Uh, there is nothing preventing you from setting up a, uh, a plugin for SNMP and, and translate it to uh, Redfish events, of course. Yeah. And, and yeah. what else do you want to say, Martin? Yeah, and that's what I was going to elaborate on a little bit, which is that um, we've we've worked within the DMTF to um, to basically enhance the networking um, uh, set of registries for the event service within Redfish, um, and so our expectation is that if you look at the set of uh, networking events that are out there, and there are now fabric, actual Ethernet fabric focused ones. Um, the expectation would be that you should be able to translate SNMP based uh, traps, you know, if it's coming from networking equipment uh, into Redfish events through um, using the event service and, and the, you know, the standardized registries. So that's how we see things, you know, developing on the, on the networking side of things anyway, with um, the you know, support of um, things like uh, SNMP. Andres had a follow-up question there, Martin. Yeah. So SNMP pooling. Um, so yeah, we'd we'd need to focus on that as well. I mean, in, in the first the first implementations that that we would have, it it would be a one-to-one uh, -one translation rather than pooling of SNMP. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we, we'll look at that. Very happy to have a follow-up on that, though, Andres. All right. Um, if nothing else on Odom, and, and please feel free to ask again while Martin is presenting, we can always jump back. But uh, we have now uh, a little section here to dive into deep edge deployment that Martin is going to present. So Martin, let, let me know when you want a new slide and so on. Yeah, sure. Will do. Thanks, Janice. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll start off with, and, and these are just some of the, um, the ideas and, and direction that, you know, our, our company HPE has uh, in, in terms of how we want to approach the market for um, the support uh, of, you know, virtualized uh, network functions um, as they move outside of core data centers. And so a lot of this, as you know, you know, there's a huge industry buzz um, around disaggregation. Um, and, you know, the, the idea really that telecoms operators take fine grained control of their infrastructure strategies, right? Uh, you know, move away from vertically integrated stacks um, that, you know, traditional networking, um, you know, telecoms equipment uh, composed of, right? Now, um, 
the, the operators are actually fairly sophisticated in what they're doing with this. Um, so it's not just about the, you know, the disaggregation of that physical infrastructure in terms of architecture disaggregation, you see on the left hand side of this picture, but also um, how they actually organize themselves as well has quite a large bearing uh, in, in terms of how companies like ours and obviously others um, would need to present you know, their solutions. And that's down to the way that those offerings are procured. Um, so typically, um, you, know, you would get uh, disaggregation uh, on the procurement side. So you have various teams within the operators that are primarily focused on just buying things like orchestration, the network functions themselves, the infrastructure, all these separate activities and actually separate parts of, um, you know, of, the, of the procurement um, arm of an operator. So, um, so again, that has a bearing in, uh, you know, not just on technology, but also you know, commercially how um, you know, solutions are actually packaged. Uh, and then the third piece is, is delivery disaggregation. And um, you know, for, for that, um, we see a fragmentation there as well in terms of, well, obviously there are, are an awful lot of um, you know, telecoms projects that are delivered via um, the major network equipment providers, and we all know who they are, um, but also um, you know, delivery of those projects uh, you know, in terms of um, you know, separation of responsibilities across hardware and infrastructure, but then an overall system integrator, non-network equipment provider system integrated, you know, taking care of um, pulling the pieces together and rolling, you know, those solutions out. Um, and then, you know, a third one, which is slightly less common, really, is the DIY approach, where the operator themselves would be responsible for, uh, for integrating the full stack of disaggregated hardware and software that they had procured. So, you know, taking all of those factors into account, um, if you want to move to the next slide, Jonas. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that we have observed, you know, as a vendor in this space is that, you know, we started in this in, in terms of horizontal disaggregation, right? You know, we, we as a vendor um, have always gone about things in, in terms of, you know, the separation of hardware and software. So, you know, separation of, um, you know, physical infrastructure from things like operating systems, network functions, et cetera. And we started off in this space, um, you know, primarily for the virtualization of core network functions. This was, you know, 10 years ago plus, um, where we took, um, you know, network functions that were originally deployed on, um, you know, proprietary appliances and had them working on industry standard servers. And we were one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer in that space. So, you know, that's, you know, from our, you know, NFV-like days that we, um, you know, we started off with in terms of core networking, we see exactly the same strategy, um, you know, um, being successful for us uh, outside of the core data centers, you know, moving, you know, from core to regional to edge and then out into the radio access network as well. So we, we see that whole momentum in terms of infrastructure disaggregation, uh, you know, moving from those, from the core to the edge with, um, you know, no let up in momentum there. Next slide. So, so what does that mean for a vendor like HPE and obviously others, I guess, in the industry, right, that are looking at horizontal disaggregation? Um, so, so to us, what that means is that, you know, we, we typically are an infrastructure vendor, you know, into the telecom space. So, um, you know, we would look to continue that across compute and networking in terms of, you know, HPE providing solutions which would be, um, you know, our infrastructure with, um, you know, a, a rich partner ecosystem for the component sets that would go into that hardware infrastructure, you know, on, on, the, on the hardware side of things, you know, so accelerators, GPUs, um, you know, uh, various CPUs, et cetera, depending on the use cases for them, but crucially as well, giving the telecoms operators choice in terms of the operating systems, virtualization, um, the, um, the infrastructure management solutions that they would use, um, and 
how they would be deployed in you know on, not just on compute but also for um, networking infrastructure as well so um, you know so we would see you know uh, hard horizontal disaggregation moving from core to edge with choices for um, you know the virtualization software stacks uh, network functions uh, management etc um, in a horizontal manner. So, you know, the thing that we are, you know, would never do as a as a vendor would be to build vertically integrated stacks with kind of best of breed software vendors, you know, and deliver those as packaged solutions. Obviously there are, you know, bespoke places where that, you know, that kind of works in the enterprise space, but, you know, generically in telco, um, then, you know, I, I think that that would close us off to the majority of the market. So, you know, our remit is all about partnering. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of, well, how do we then, and, and this is why a project like Odom um, and our participation in open source is so critical to us. Um, because, you know, if you think that, um, you know, we're gonna have these computer networking stacks um, in terms of infrastructure, we wanna make sure that we expose that infrastructure to northbound clients that need to manage that infrastructure in as open as possible um, manner. So um, the use of um, Odom in terms of providing an aggregated view of all of the infrastructure inside these data centers and you know, getting more crucially as you start moving towards the radio access network and um, you know, the, the multiples of you know, small aggregation points that you're gonna have as part of that um, you know, projects like Odin become more and more important uh, in, in terms of giving a standards-based visibility of that physical infrastructure that's going to exist in those um, um, in, in those areas, so that you can perform lifecycle management of that infrastructure. Next slide. So, so we see this, um, you know, primarily in um, you know in the radio access network because of 3GPP and their, their functional splits for the radio access network, the, the implication for that, you know, for, a, for an infrastructure vendor like ourselves, is that, um, you know, telecoms environments for the radio access network are gonna vary wildly across operators. So, um, you know, our placement of, you know, compute and ethernet switching in our, you know, in, in the case of HPE, well, you know, those deployment architectures are, are going to be very different depending on, um, you know, the chosen set of functional splits that the operator has. And then obviously within individual operators, you know, there could be more than one split as well. So you could end up with, you know, centralized, um, you know, aggregated um, points of presence where you would have you know, multiples of physical uh, compute nodes that are doing baseband processing, that, you know, as would occur, um, you know, with, with associated, um, you know, low latency synchronized ethernet switching, you know, as would occur in the case of something like a, a you know, a centralized RAN um, versus a DRAN deployment where you may want to collapse network functions, you know, onto uh, individual servers. So, uh, so next slide. So, so what that means for a vendor like us is that it means that we are looking at, you know, a number of investigations in terms of how do we build these, you know, infrastructure blueprints for the radio access network and still follow the model for, um, you know, disaggregation in telco networks, right? So, so obviously, you know, the, the areas of focus that we have would be, you know, beyond just product selection, um, you know, which would be based on space, environmental and power constraints. So, you know, which would be the right product lines that we'd want to pull into these types of architecture. It's really crucial to us as well to build a component and software vendor ecosystem, just like we've done for the core network. You know, we, we aim to continue to do exactly that for the radio access network as well. Um, and so, you know, one, once we've pulled those two aspects together, then, you know, the, the work then is all about the integration then of network and transport functions. And we want to make sure that, you know, we, we, we have those, you know, capability to have those deployed on as few devices as, 
as possible. And this is absolutely crucial because of the lack of space and power, you know, the environmental constraints that you're going to have in these, um, in these points of presence. So, so integration is, you know, is an absolutely key, um, you know, area of focus that we need to have. Um, and on top of that, the, you know, when, when you're looking at integration and the, the network functions themselves, then, you know, where would you actually want to deploy those network functions? You know, how do you optimize network function placement? Because if you imagine then that you have, you know, combinations of compute and switching within, um, you know, individual locations, then you should be able to deploy network functions, uh, you know, on the, on the correct um, set of infrastructure, be that compute, you know, Ethernet switching, etc. cetera. Um, and on top of that as well, um, you know, when you're deploying things like, you know, management stacks, et cetera, then, you know, deploy that in, you know, the, the, that's, you know, those software stacks, um, again, on, on infrastructure that makes the most sense so that you have the smallest possible footprint for these locations. So these are, you know, a couple of extremely um, you know, strong areas of focus that we have in terms of integrated transport network and VRAM functions, maybe on uh, you know, individual servers versus reduced footprint aggregation, and then the optimal you know, placement of network functions you know, across that, you know, those, that aggregated set of infrastructure. Um, and then obviously, you know, through the um, you know our participation in uh, in ORAN, um, then it would be all about well you know so we have this infrastructure uh, we want to make sure that it's open in terms of um, you know how a a third party can manage it so um, so open distributed management of aggregated physical and virtual infrastructure again is a you know is, is an area of focus for us. So, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor then as to, you know, the directions that HPE is looking at for, uh, for disaggregation uh, in, uh, you know, as, as the industry moves towards disaggregation uh, in telecoms networks and, you know, particularly focused on, uh, on the radio access network. Um, next slide. And so, you know, that ends up then with being a, you know, a value proposition um, that, sort of stems from the heritage that we have already in telecoms networks you know there's nothing necessarily new here um, so you know we really have competencies in terms of you know compliance testing for operating systems drivers component sets you know, NEBS compliance etc um, you know there's a strong competency in terms of building blueprints um, you know initially for the core network um, but then moving those out towards the radio access network um, sets of tool chains for, um, you know, for the, the bootstrapping and provisioning of that infrastructure um, as a service offerings through GreenLake, and then obviously the development work that we're doing um, through, through Odom and that project. So we see, you know, the combination then of all of those capabilities, you know, allows for companies like ours to have end-to-end -end telco infrastructure enablement. Um, so uh, that that was uh, that was all I was uh, going to present for this piece of it, but hopefully it just gives you a flavour then of the direction um, that that our company is, is moving in in terms of um, you know uh, aggregation and um, architectures for uh, for deep edge deployments. Yeah, and I don't see any new questions online, so perhaps uh, I think we're done for today then okay well thank you much very much everybody yeah thank you all right thanks everyone for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your day thank you